Hello, Scott. Scott, can you hear me? Rabbi Mendelssohn, I can hear you and see you. How about that? Fantastic. We're so excited about this evening. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Well, it's, it's my extreme pleasure. Uh, I don't know if David told you, but under other circumstances, had there been no virus, my wife and I would be in Jackson Hole the week after Labor Day. And <laughs> I, I would have asked to postpone this event till then so that we could be there in person and meet you and shake your hand and say hello to everyone. Yes, well, uh, David did mention that. And so uh, I'm glad that you have a personal connection to Jackson Hole. We love this place. This is one of the most beautiful places on earth. and uh, so. We hope that the next time you come visit, we'll have the opportunity to be able to host you for a Shabbat dinner. Um, or... We love that very much. Uh, and I, I hope and pray that a year from now, we can reschedule our visit and uh, make that happen. Uh, we, my wife and I, and I may talk about this a bit when the, the whole group joins us, but my wife and I, through business travel and American Technion Society travel and vacationing, have been to every state except possibly North Dakota and Arkansas, and by far one of our favorite places is, is Jackson Hole. Yeah, I've been to about 30 countries in almost every state myself, and um, I'm not biased when I say this is my favorite. Uh, I just believe it's just so peaceful and beautiful and raw and rugged. Uh, it's very special out here, so. Exactly, uh, nature at its best. Exactly. Right. David, are you there? Yes. Hello, Rabbi. Hello. How are you doing, nice David? Spot. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We're so oh, grateful to have you. It's it's absolute pleasure. Let me just get my uh, backlighting so I don't... There, that's a little bit better. Thank you so much for inviting us and enabling for us to be together with your community. It feels like something important to do. Yes. I mean, over the last uh, four months, we've been doing something really unique in that uh, we've essentially had uh, two events on average per week uh, highlighting some important thing that is going on in the world. It could be an important person, it could be an important subject, uh, but we've had some of the most incredible speakers, um, presenters on so many different topics, um, professors, doctors on the front lines, uh, people that are involved in COVID vaccines. Uh, we had recently a breathing uh, presentation where uh, a yogi talked about breathing and uh, how that can help you during times of stress and, and crisis. Um, we've had ones on self-defense and gun safety. We've had Alan Dershowitz talk about the case for Israel. We've had uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna talk about anti-Semitism and the history of, um, of anti-Semitism. Uh, we've had uh, Holocaust survivors. It's just been a, a wild ride for four months straight, one after the next after the next, of these incredible presentations that have been so inspiring. And we've sort of become a role model in Chabad. Uh, my colleagues are checking out what we're doing and then they're copying us and doing a lot of the same kinds of events or similar types of events. We did a day in the life of a Wyoming police officer not too long ago where we highlighted the chief of police and the local sheriff to tell the stories of bravery, challenge, what protocols they have in place to keep the community safe, all that type of stuff. So it's just really, really been uh, wonderful. And so we're grateful to have you. Uh, Karen's actually gonna do a presentation herself next week to talk about her father's photography during World War II um, that he captured as a American soldier um, in World War II. And that's gonna be a fascinating um, presentation. And then, uh, in early September, uh, we have a few others that we're working on that are just a matter of just um, finishing off the, the last little details. But uh, the next firm one that we have is in early September, we have um, Omer Yankalevich is going to be talking to our community, uh, the current first Haredi woman minister in an Israeli government. Um, and she's going to be telling her story of how she went from growing up non-observant, non-Orthodox, uh, going to an Orthodox school and becoming Orthodox, uh, later moving on to go to school, get a, a degree in law, becoming an activist for unity in a similar way that what you guys are doing to bring people together from all different types of communities in Israel, particularly with uh, Arabs and Israelis, uh, and Haredim, I should say. Uh, this is my wife, Razi. Hello. Hello, nice Razi. Hi, Razi. How are you? I'm good, thank God. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. 
So, um, so she's going to be talking for our community. We're opening that up to more Chabad's to make it a little bit of a broader a reach. But it's just been fascinating, you know, um, a real joyous ride. We've taken lemons and made lemonade out of it. And in spite of the fact that there's a lot of suffering that's going on, we found some kind of silver lining. I knew there would be one, and it just was a matter of time to find it, and we thank God found it. Wonderful. Extraordinary. Been, uh, pretty special. Do you have uh, any idea how many people will be joining us tonight? You know, I don't. Um, each time it's sort of different. We sort of let it just be. Um, we've, we have um, typically anywhere between um, 10 and 100 people joining us, which is a pretty broad, hi Pamela, a broad group of people that are joining us from all different kinds of places. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we have on Facebook, usually somewhere between 50 and 100 people watching live during the presentation on Facebook as well. Wow. So, yeah, turns it into we an We get typically more views on Facebook than on Zoom. Yes. That's really, really fascinating. And I have to learn your secret about how you've been able to recruit such a diverse group of speakers and some of the great minds and thinkers from the U.S. and from Israel to to join your community and and teach and learn. That's really extraordinary. Uh, please remind me the name of the woman who uh, was in the Peace Corps and has written about her experiences and is part of your community. She's about to join us. Yeah. She's on right now. I'm going to unmute her. Or what I'm going to her name. Her. I'm sorry, I have forgotten her name. Her name is Karen McQuillan. I'm making her currently a co-host, and I'm also going to make you guys co-hosts. So. If you are familiar with Zoom and want to play around a little bit more and use yes. some of the features, you're welcome to do that. Hello, Karen. Hi. Hello, nice Karen. I'm Scott. You. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Scott. Okay, I hear you, but I don't see you. You don't see me. Okay. Why is this? Let's see. Your video seems like it's not on. Let me start video, okay? I'm, there I am. Here we go. It's nice to finally meet you, Karen, via this technology. I'm I know. <laughs> I know. Th these Zoom meetings are really quite wonderful in connecting people long really distances. Are. There we go. You get to see everyone's bookcase. <laughs> yes. yes. And it's not a virtual one. It's, those are real books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most have been read. <laughs> So on Sunday, David and I had the uh, pleasure and opportunity to be on a Zoom meeting with our, our International Board of Governors, which included people from, I don't know how many different countries, but it included Australia. And in uh, Detroit, where I am, it was noon, but in Australia, it was 2 a.m. And there were still people uh, who clicked, clicked in and uh, enjoyed the experience with us. Well, that's real dedication, I'm impressed. It could even be a different day. Yes. Well, those Australians are hardy people. They're very, really wonderful people, positive and engaged. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the same is true for uh, the people of Wyoming in the community yes. of Wyoming. We have a guy from Australia that's been joining almost all of our events. It's a great time. It's like a 10 a.m. or something for him. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this meeting because I expect to learn a lot. You know, it's funny, even though I've been connected with you in some way for years and years, um, these sorts of meetings really give an opportunity to, to go into things in much greater depth. That is true. Aaron, I'd love to see you if you can come on video. Oh, there you are. I am. Um, I got a little box telling me that my connection is unstable. So if I disappear, then you'll just have to take over. Okay. Maybe maybe try and sign out and sign back in. Oh, I just copy. upgraded with Comcast the speed of our internet because this fall. Uh, the, my son in high school will be learning virtually and my wife and I will be working um, with a lot of the work being done by Zoom. So bandwidth, it will be very important. 
It's a new world we live in. It's a totally new world. We should mention that one of the, the VPs of research and development at Zoom is a Technion graduate. <laughs> and uh, about a year and a half ago, when our former president, uh, Peretz Levy, left office, uh, he made a gift to him of uh, providing Zoom for free on the campus. Little did he know what a, <laughs> what a tremendous gift that turned out to be for the Technion. A great. If I'm you are on Facebook and seeing us live, please click like, I please don't, say hello, let stuff. us know where you're tuning in from. Is, is We're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes on this Zoom and would love for you to be able to let us know that you're watching us live on Facebook. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, just tell us a hello. Um, we want to be sure that all of the technology is working. If you're Hello. joining us on Facebook, let us know you are here. We would love to be able to know that you are joining us. We are going to be starting in one minute. Did you turn off your camera? No. Can you turn off my iPad and phone? And my phone too. You want to turn it off? If you are joining us on Facebook, please give us a like, say hello, let us know that you're there so we can be sure that this is all working and we can get started. We'd love to see that you are joining us on Facebook by giving us a like, a hello, tell us where you're tuning in from. We are going to get started with this evening's event and hopefully um, those of us who are, are joining us on Facebook will, uh, will be able to watch along. Hello and welcome and thank you all so much for joining us for this evening's virtual presentation with David Shivo and Scott Lee Master titled The Innovation Nation for Everyone, Technion's Unique Role in Engaging and Educating Israel's Ultra-Orthodox Community. My name is Rabbi Zalman Mendelssohn and I serve as the co-director of the Chabad Jewish Center of Wyoming together with my wife, Razi. It is a wonderful to see familiar faces, and it is my great pleasure to welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. Our mission at the Chabad Jewish Center of Wyoming is to share the beauty of Jewish tradition, history, education, and Torah with the Jewish community of Wyoming and beyond. But more than just that, during these challenging, isolating times, times in which we find ourselves alone, we know that these virtual presentations are a form of community gathering that are particularly important, bringing us all together. In Jewish tradition, we are currently in the process of reading in the Torah portion of the Eschanon, where Moses recounts the Jewish people to the Jewish people, the story of receiving the Torah and the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Essentially, this is the story of the Jewish people's experience at Sinai and history's first account of moral values being shared with the entire world. No greater moral value exists than the value of inclusivity, of love, of bringing people together as one. And so tonight we are deeply grateful to have two guests of honor who will share with us what they are doing to engage the Haredi Jewish community and bring together people from diverse backgrounds to ensure a greater and more and healthier society. A few housekeeping items before we begin our interview. First, I'd like to thank Elon Wood for the time, grace, and effort he has put into making this event possible. Second, I'd like to share with you two of our upcoming events. These were very recently confirmed, and so just bear with me. On this next Thursday, August, 6th at 7.30 p.m. We will be hosting an event with Karen McQuillan, who will be sharing 
photos and talking about her father who served as a photographer in the US Army during World War II. Please join us at 7.30 p.m. Thursday, August 6th. On September 6th at 9.45 a.m., we are going to be hosting a, the first Haredi woman to serve as a minister in an Israeli government, Omer Yankelovich. Please join us for a fascinating story of how one woman has broken so many barriers, climbed so high in Israeli social and political life, and is continuously making a difference in the community there. The schedule this evening will begin with a 30-minute dialogue that Karen McQuillan will engage with our two guests of honor. During these 30 minutes, please send in your questions to the chat box that you would like our guests to answer. I will do my best to incorporate your questions into the discussion that we will open up to the community later on. As you all know, many in the Jewish community are struggling now during these uncertain times. We at Chabad have been consistently supporting people in a variety of ways, including the most basic human expression of love by sharing food and household staples with members of our community who are struggling. Please consider making a one-time tax-deductible contribution to the Chabad uh, to the Rabbi's Discretionary Fund at jewishwyoming.com slash donate <laughs> so we can continue to respond to the crisis at hand and share with our community. It is now my great pleasure to invite our dear friend Karen McQuillan, who's been one of the longest standing members of our community before even Razi and I knew each other. Karen was engaged and involved in Chabad's activities here in Jackson. We are deeply grateful for Karen's support for our community events and programs and services. And I know that Karen takes great pride in her support for the Technion as well. Please put your hands together for a warm Chabad welcome to Karen McQuillan. Thank you very much. So I, I'm delighted to be introducing David Shivo and Scott Lee Master today to tell us about the Technion, which is the Israeli Institute of Technology. It's really no exaggeration to say that the Technion is the single biggest driver behind Israel's preeminence in scientific and technological innovation and crucial to Israel's security needs. On a personal note, I want to say how I became interested in the Technion's program for the Haredi, and it was through Rezi's brother, Yossi, who some of you may have met in past years at our Yom Kippur services. You may not know that he served in the IDF, in the elite intelligence service, and he was accepted by the Technion. He did not end up going, but it was learning about it through him that got me interested. And contributing to this endeavor is just one of those wonderful things you can do that help people on so many different levels. First of all, it helps the, the, the family of that Haredi student who will go on to become, um, to have a good salary and be able to provide for his children. So you're being kind to children and families. It's also good because there are so many ultra-Orthodox in Israel today. They're an amazing resource of brains that Israel can use in their economy and in their future. And um, lastly, it really helps the whole world because the research that goes on in the Technion saves lives all over the world. So it's extremely satisfying. And um, just reading the Technion report you get each, each month is, is amazingly cheerful because it's like reading about miracles every day. Uh, one of my favorite examples from this month is a, a student project and she developed an injection you can give to wounded soldiers in the field that contains bioengineered bacteria that go to the source of internal bleeding and initiate a rapid coagulation process to save that soldier's life. Things like this do really take your breath away. 
and you know that in a few years this will be universal and be saving lives all over the world. So it's a great privilege to even have a tiny connection to these amazing things. But as we all know, none of this could happen without money, and money is not going to happen without people like Scott and David, who are devoting their lives to helping build a vibrant net network throughout the United States to support these endeavors. Uh, David has been working in Jewish philanthropy for many years. He's worked for the Bayat Hat Putzot, the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv, which I think many of you have visited on trips to Israel. He's also worked for the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, the Jewish Community Center of Greater Boston and Hebrew College, and um, holds a master's degree from Brandeis, which is my alma mater also, and MIT. Scott is the, ch we're very honored to have Scott with us today. He's the chairman of the Technion Board of Governors. He's the former national president of the American Technion Society. He and his wife, Susie, are not only prominent philanthropists in Detroit, but they are the two people who started this program for the Haredi at the Technion. He's just one of those really giving, big hearted people who uses his skills from the business world and his drive from the business world to travel all over America, bringing up the level of American Technion organization. So I'm very eager to hear about what both of them have to say. And also I understand, Scott, you and your wife, Susie, have a connection to Jackson. Well, Karen, that's true. In fact, it's, it's a bit ironic that we are meeting this at, through this means at this time. If, if uh, not for the virus, and I had had this invitation, I, I would have asked if it could be postponed until the week after Labor Day because my wife, Susie, and I had reservations to spend time in your neighborhood um, some people on the, this call may be familiar with a place called Jenny Lake. Do you know where Jenny Lake sure. is? Just yeah. north of the loose. Uh, we have been there, I would say, four times. It, uh, we have, over the years, through business travel, ATS travel, and vacationing, have been to every state in the Union except two, Arkansas and North Dakota. We've been to numerous places around the world. And I'm not saying this just because of the particular audience who is hearing this, but uh, Jackson Hole is one of our very favorite places in the world. In fact, I think if we were given the choice of going to pick a city in Europe or Jackson Hole, we would just as soon go to Jackson Hole. Thank you. Uh, but we love mountains. We love high desert climate. We like panoramic vistas. I love fly fishing. Um, on one of our visits, uh, I'll share something, but you have to promise not to tell anybody else. Uh, my son Jacob and I, who is now 32, went uh, kayaking on the Snake River. And uh, at the afternoon, at the end of our afternoon, when I took off our, our life jackets and our helmets and so on, my son pointed out that I had about a dozen red squares on the top of my head from the sunburn that uh, I had accumulated during the day. And it was probably three days later before he could look at me without bursting into laughter. But we have many happy memories and we look forward to coming back and making more at some point. Well, that's wonderful. Next time you'll have friends to look up also. Absolutely. So my first question is just to give us a very brief int introduction to the Technion. I think most people here have heard of it in a general way, but could you explain to us the role it plays in Israel as the incubator for startups? I'll be glad to take this. And of course, Scott, uh, you have at least as much knowledge, probably more than, than I do on, on, on the Technion, so please jump in. But before I do, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Karen, for inviting us and Rabbi and Rebitson. It really is uh, a pleasure to be part of your community tonight. And how unique is it that Zoom enables us to come together here with you in Wyoming from Seattle, where I live, in Detroit, where, where Scott and his family live, to be with you tonight. So to, to tell you about the Technion, and, and I really promised uh, Elon and Karen and, and, and the rabbi that we will speak as informed voices and, and not as people who are going to be making a pitch because our story has to be based on authenticity and yet it is a, a really incredible story and that is that Technion can really be considered a national treasure of Israel. It, it was started in 1912, Israel's first university and its essence was really to 
create the, the Zionist dream. And, and once you finish dreaming and start thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be real. We're going to build a country. Then you start thinking about infrastructure. And when you think about infrastructure, you think about engineering and architecture and, and water and hydrology and electricity. And that was the basis of why the Technion was created, uh, founded in 1912, opened in 1924. They needed a capital campaign in between, a few other things. And it, were, it was dreamers like Albert Einstein, who also founded the first Technion societies, first in Germany, then in the US, who helped make the Technion possible. And what I then want to share with you is how Technion evolved from a national infrastructure enterprise into the university that it is today. And I think that the way to describe it is part of it was driven by dreaming and another whole part of it was driven by something that is uh, unique to, I think, the Jewish people and, and that is chutzpah. And, and why chutzpah? Because of some big bets the university made along the way. <clears throat> In, in the late 1940s, there was a professor named Israel Sederbaum, whose son is also an alum of the Technion and a wonderful supporter of ours in the Bay Area. He created the very first solid state laboratory at the Technion when the university had no business doing that. And that led to faculties of electrical engineering first and then computer science. In 1954, the university at the request or a pretty strong persuasion of David Ben-Gurion, started a faculty of aerospace engineering before Israel owned a plane. And that led to the security and defense of the country and a $10 billion industry of air and space in, in, in Israel that employs over 100,000 people. David, yes. David, let me just interject here for one second because I, and I'll share this with you, I don't think you're aware of this, but uh, Yitzhak Apeloy, who was the president of the Technion, I would say, 12 years ago, was telling me his personal recollection of this period of, of time when the Technion launched, at that time it was not called aerospace, it was called aeronautic, mm -hmm. aeronautical engineering. And the attitude of the general Israeli population is, this is crazy. This is, we, are, we, we don't have any planes, let alone cars. And he said that cars were so rare at that time that if somebody drove through the neighborhood, all the children would run out of their houses and chase it down the street because there was very few of them. So just, it's just to, to underscore the visionary thinking that was taking place at that time, the looking to the future, what are the needs of the country 10 years, 15 years down the road, and we need to begin placing the bricks in place now to address them. So that was just an example of the visionary thinking that has occurred periodically over the years at the Technion. And there are many other examples that we could recite. It's a beautiful story and, and so true because I have family <clears throat> who lived in Lud and, <clears throat> and talked about what, was, is, what, was, what Israel was like in, in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, let's just say it was not the innovation nation and, uh, and a center of, of technology. But let me just conclude my section by, by just sharing three other matters uh, or three facts that I think really define what the Technion means to Israel, why I call it a national treasure. One is the impact of its alums. If, if MIT disappeared tomorrow, that would be very sad for the US and for technology and for innovation, but the country would go on. If the Technion disappeared, that would be existentially a tremendous challenge to Israel because the 77,000 alums, living alums in Israel, provide or represent approximately 25% of Israel's GDP, which in, uh, <clears throat> in 2019 was $400 billion. So it's the underpinning of the, of the economy. And David, Second, David I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you again, and we haven't done this before, so this is sort of an impromptu yeah. tag team back and forth, and I, I promise I will shut up in a moment. But <laughs> no, It's all just, good. Just to underscore your point, uh, the Technion is compared to the MIT, but to MIT, but it is not a fair comparison. Uh, I, MIT is fantastic. Uh, my son, Jacob, who is 32, has been there for four years working in Lincoln Labs. It's a phenomenal place. 
But we also have Georgia Tech, we have Caltech, we have Carnegie Mellon, we have so many other great engineering schools who are providing the technical brain power that, that is building this country. In Israel, Technion is it. It is the pipeline that has provided the technical civil engineering in the early days and mechanical engineering, medical school eventually, aeronautical engineering, aerospace eventually. But it is the place that has provided eight out of 10 of the engineers that are at Rafael, Israel Aircraft Industries, you name it, this is the place. I'm going to turn it back over to Karen because otherwise uh, Scott yeah. and I are just going to bounce around and uh, complete each other's sentences, but it exactly. probably won't be the rich experience that you were all hoping there, for. <laughs> there's so much to say about the Technion's achievements, but I, I want to focus on the students. Can you tell us about your student body, how many students you have? Um, David, you had told me something about your outreach to Israeli Arab um, students and scientists, yeah. that I think is a good background to before we get into the outreach to Haredes. Sure. Scott, do you want to go first? <laughs> or uh, Go ahead. I'll, I'll pick up okay. where you leave off. Okay, good. But please, uh, you have uh, a free card to, uh, to jump in at any time and correct me if I get something wrong. Well, Technion has about 15,000 students. The uh, ratio is about 10,500 in the undergraduate programs in 19 different faculties, including a medical school, and about 4,500 students doing uh, master's and PhD students. Other important demographics, about a little bit under 40% of the Technion student population are women. Now, what you're finding, though, is that the population in the graduate and the PhD programs is at par or slightly um, over 50% in terms of women. Now, Technion also is a university that has a charter. And in its charter, it says, we are here to build a nation economically around security and to contribute to the advancement of science and ideas in, in the world. And the Technion really takes us to heart. And one of the ways in which the university lives that out is through its demographics. One example being that 20%, a little over 20% of all Technion students are um, from the Arab Israeli population. And that mirrors the percentage of Arab Israelis in, in the country itself, which means that it is one of the great social equalizers and, and an, an experiment, a laboratory for how the future of the society could look like. But I'll also just mention, and then of course allow Scott to, to share his insights, uh, is that the student population, while being representative of all facets of Israel, is unique in that it is an apolitical campus. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, it's Israelis, they all have opinions. But when it comes to the work in the labs, as engineers, as scientists, as researchers, what binds them together is ideas and not political divisions. And that makes the Technion so unique and particularly strong. Scott, your insights? But it's just a, a, a universal belief on the campus depending, it does not depend on your ethnicity, your gender, or your national origin, or your religion, that uh, we're all here to advance ourselves. We all represent the most valuable resource that Israel has, and that is the brains of our population. We need to enable them, expand them, make them as strong and powerful as they can be for the individuals and also for the good of the country. So Scott, could you please uh, keep on the microphone and tell, tell us about how you and your wife, Susie, decided to recruit and integrate Haredi into the student body. Um, where, where were you? Where are you now? And what are your goals for the future? Well, this idea, although I didn't realize it at the time, this, the seed of this idea was planted, I would say about eight years ago. Uh, some friends of ours within the American Technion Society put together a weekend in Boston. They, they live in Boston and, and they put together a, a weekend they called Israeli Innovation Weekend. And they had put together a whole variety of startups and other uh, companies that had come out of the Technion 
and gave them a, a forum in Boston for them to present their ideas, what they were working on. And it was, some of it was very high tech, some of it was low tech, but it was all very innovative. And it was all about ideas coming out of Israel to make the world a better place. And at the end of this weekend, there was a panel. And this was during the time of the startup nation phenomenon. The, not, the book had just come out, it was extremely popular, getting a lot of press. Um, and so the questions sort of centered on that moment in time. The panel included, among others, uh, President Peretz Levy, and he fielded the last question of this Q&A uh, session. I was, and it's still uh, seared in my memory because it was a fundamental question. Israel was at a, a, a high point. They were, they were riding the wave of success, notoriety. The world was taking notice of the amazing things that this tiny country was doing. Uh, among the giants of the world. And uh, the question was, okay, Israel's at this high point. What is the single biggest threat that could undermine Israel's future progress in continuing along this path? And without hesitation, he said that at this moment in Jerusalem, for every student that's studying mathematics, science, and history, there are 10 who are studying only Torah, just Torah. And that is going to cause over time uh, an imbalance among the various segments of society. And not only that, Israel needs to tap into that resource. These are brilliant people. We need to give them the opportunity to learn not just Torah, but other subjects as well and enable them, give them, not force them or, or you know, make it a duty, but give them the opportunity if they were motivated in this direction to, to begin to study other things and to uh, become uh, more integrated into the Israeli society as a whole. Now, there are tensions around that philosophy, I understand that, but there are people within that community and outside that community that, that see some benefit in this. And I personally believe that as in the spirit of enabling people and helping them expand their capabilities, uh, I think this was a very uh, cogent moment for me to embark on this. I had no idea at the time that this was where we would end up, but I, the Israeli government has sort of endorsed this concept after the fact for me because they see the desirability of these types of initiatives to the extent that when they are formulating their budgetary support for the various universities in Israel, they look at, among other factors, the number of Haredi graduates that they are producing. And it's, so it is clearly something that the government wants. It is clearly something that some members, an increasing number of members within the Haredi community want. And so there is this need for programs such as the one that the TechNet has designed, has uh, gone through several iterations, learning along the way. And I think they have arrived at what can be a very effective model going forward. Please describe your model and what you've done so far, what's been working, what the challenges are. Well, one of the challenges is that uh, at the starting point, the uh, potential students for the Technion have had um, a very limited um, exposure. They don't have any uh, mathematical skills to speak of at that point. Um, I'm looking for some notes I have here. Just bear with me for one second. I, I can just jump in while you look at that. and, and just oh, here, here, here we go. Um, there, there are several parts of the program that um, help these students start from the point where they are and move forward. There is a, a basic studies section of the program, which is a five-month program in the home communities of the ultra-Orthodox, primarily in B'nai Brock, and it focuses on 12th grade STEM skills. And following that, there is something called the Pre-University Center which is a 10 month intensive program to prepare students for matriculating at the Technion. For most students also taught in their home communities, while for some, they study directly at the Technion. And then there is what is called an academic bridge year, which includes support of students to enable them to meet the Technion coursework, which is a very high level, speaking in general terms, it's a very high level by comparison and it includes classes at partner institutions while meeting, they're not all at the Technion, but they meet Technion standards. 
and they receive full Technion credit for that work. And then there is the completion of the ac academic degree itself with both classes in Haifa and at other uh, partner institutions in Israel. And especially important uh, are the ongoing support systems and financial aid because there are many uh, additional challenges for members of this community to be successful along this path. There are uh, currently about 50 students in the program. I don't know, is this the third cohort, uh, David, or perhaps more, I think, at this point, I'm not it's sure. Fourth, actually. Fourth, I think it's the fourth cohort. Um, so it has been a trial and error, and I think many of the bugs, if you would, would call them that, have been smoothed out, and it is a, a very effective and productive program. Agreed. I'll just add to it one uh, element, which is the, the, the center of it is something called, uh, as Scott mentioned, the pre-university center. The Hebrew term for it is mechina, which means preparation. Now, the pre-university center originally started in the 60s to help returning soldiers after uh, several years in, in IDF service who may have forgotten some of their physics and mathematics to be prepared for Technion, for studies of the Technion. It then evolved to address the needs of the growing waves of immigration, particularly from uh, so former Soviet Jewry. And then it took on a particularly social and societal mission around disadvantaged populations, what's called the peripheria, the peripheral communities, aforementioned Arab Israeli community, Ethiopian Israelis, and today its, its mission has uh, now includes, of course, the, the Haredi. Now, what I want to underscore, which is what differentiates the US model from the Israeli model, and in particular, the Technion model, is this is not about affirmative action. It does not exist at the Technion. It is about raising individuals who are willing to to work hard and to be partners in this. It's about raising them to stand the highest standards of excellence. And it's so typical of Israelis. It can be tough, but if your heart's in it and you work hard and you're putting your mind to work, you can't have a better partner than the, uh, the staff and the colleagues of ours at the pre-university center. They will help you succeed. And that's the real magic of the program. So tell, does the program have components after the preparatory phase to help the students uh, integrate into the classes and continue to support them or to meet special needs such as already having a family? Yes, I, I think that's, uh, Scott, I, please speak to this as well. I think one of the, the key differences with the Haredi population is that so many of them already will have families with young children, which is why so much of the program itself will take place in the home communities, as opposed to saying, uh, time to move to Haifa. And Haifa is a wonderful city. It's probably my favorite city in Israel. It is not known as an epicenter of, of uh, I mean, it, it, it's of course the religiously observant Jewish people living there, but it's not the same as let's say Yerushalayim or uh, parts of Tel Aviv, uh, B'nai Brak, where these, these people have their families and their homes. Now, the other thing to, to mention is what, what differentiates this program and has enabled it to succeed is the partnership, not only during the pre-university center, but at all the other steps along the academic journeys of the, the Haredi students. So they will receive extra support in terms of tutoring. They will receive, of course, financial aid. They, it, for the extent that uh, being in mixed classrooms is a challenge to them, gender mixed, uh, I, I mean, that's something that can be accommodated in, in their home communities. Of course, if they go to the Technion, they're part of the, the, the general student population. So incredible efforts are being made to give them every tool, every resource, so that they can be successful, not only for themselves, of course, but for their communities and for Israel and, and frankly, the Jewish people. So are they doing distance learning? And if so, how do they participate in the laboratory part of the classes? I think the, uh, the way it works- That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think in, in this day, at this particular moment in time, I, I would say 
as much as they were before, they are more now and, and will be more in the future. I mean, distance learning has found its niche and, and is not going away. And it's certainly in this particular application of a special value, I think. I think in a way the, the idea of uh, distance learning has been, has been made for communities such as RVD. And it's one of the reasons why they're also finding success in the workplace because many of them can work in their, especially if it's uh, women who may face their own unique and distinct challenges, if they can conduct their work from home. Um, Amazon, for example, has discovered this with, with less trained individuals that uh, Haredi women are making make phenomenal employees because they're able to do this from home and they don't have to worry about uh, the, the contact with, with uh, the general population if that was a challenge. And boy, do they work hard. They, they really have, have gone above and beyond. It's a, it's, a, it's a unique case study that one day someone will study uh, in more detail. So, so my last question was, can you tell us some, something about some of the specific Israeli students and what they are working on? Uh, do, uh, Scott, do you want to talk about uh, Dr. Sabiner or? Well, one of the more uh, featured ex graduates of this program is Yehuda Sabiner, who uh, is, went through this program with the, all the initial challenges that you can expect he would have faced he expressed his wishes to his rabbi and, he, and his ultimate goal was to become a doctor and, and relieve suffering and save lives. And his rabbi said, you are absolutely doing this for the right reasons. And he supported Yehuda and he went through the various phases of the program as David described them and I described them. And he is the first Israeli born Haredi MD. And uh, he is the role model for many others who've come after him. He is the exact example that you want to have others try to emulate. He's a wonderful man. He's doing wonderful work. And uh, this is one of the main goals of the program is to give people who have this desire the opportunity to fulfill that desire. That, yes, he, he would make a great speaker at some point. He has spoken on behalf of the American Technion Society, yet he's an MD. If he's not, if I'm not um, mistaken, he's a PD, uh, he's an OBGYN, Scott, I think. Uh, OBGYN, yes. Yeah, and so we were catching him between shifts at, uh, uh, at the hospital where he works. Now, in terms of the other students, though, as I mentioned, Technion has 19 faculties, and you find the Haridim throughout every aspect of Technion, be it architecture or biomedical engineering or material science. Interestingly enough, uh, many of them choose civil engineering, not because civil engineering is, is, is easier, it's just, it seems to be a field to which they have uh, gravitated. Uh, I also want to mention that there are other programs at Technion that also support the people from Orthodox backgrounds who are not ultra-Orthodox, and I met one of them in January of this year. It was a lovely woman named Daniela, she was of Sephardic Jewish background, meaning for those who don't know from the, the Jews of Spain and from the Arab countries. And she was the first person in her family to ever go to university. And she, she spoke about the, the cultural challenges and the, the difficulties of, of going to the Technion and spoke very clearly that the support that she receives on campus has been make or break for her. And this is a student who initially failed out of her first year. And the Technion said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not giving up on you this quickly. Uh, she's now a fourth year student in electrical engineering who works part-time at Intel. So there are these real incredible success stories. And what we believe is perhaps uh, the, the greatest amount of promise is the multiplier effects. It's, it's, uh, it is, a, as Scott mentioned, it will inspire more people from, from more religiously observant communities to consider pathways in which they can have a wonderful career while being Torah Jews, being fully observant and, and upholding the mitzvot to the fullest. And universities such as the Technion really enable that to happen. Thank you so much for those moving stories. 
Zalman, I'm going to hand the meeting over to you to handle the general Q&A. Awesome. Thank you very, very much for that. Please put your hands together for Karen, for Scott, and for David. That was just fantastic. Wonderful job. Great presentation. Great question. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Uh, we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, for those of you uh, who have questions for our presenters, want to learn more about this particular program at the Technion, or any questions you have about the Technion, um, please go ahead, unmute yourself. We're going to be casual tonight. We're, uh, we're a smaller, more intimate crowd than usual. So it allows for us to just be able to go on and ask your questions directly to our presenters. Uh, Pamela, you typed in a question yourself privately to me. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question directly, please go ahead and do so. Thank you, Rabbi Zalman. Um, I just wanted to ask Scott and David, are all scientific fields of study offered at Technion? The, the uh, Scott, what would be your answer to that? I don't know of an exception, but I, I don't know what that universe includes in by your definition. Well, quantum physics, I wondered if they oh, go yeah. that oh, yes. the direction there, there, as well. Yes, there is a major focus on quantum physics, uh, as you may know. In fact, this would be a good time for me to point out that I, I brought two guests with me tonight. I don't know if you noticed this, but on, on the wall behind me, you'll see two photographs. Over my right shoulder is the current president of the university, Uri Savan who was a world-renowned physicist, nanotechnologist. Um, he, as he describes his work, he, he lives at the boundary between nanoscale electronics and biological processes. So his team is the team that uh, inscribed the entire Bible onto a, I think a chip, I would call it that, but smaller than a grain of salt. And uh, the Pope has one. The, the Technion gave one to the Pope as a, as a special gift. And over my other shoulder is uh, Professor Peretz Levy, who was the previous president of the Technion for 10 years. An incredible individual and uh, a sleep researcher, uh, not quantum physics or nanotechnology, but a, an important science as well. So there is the gamut. Uh, and it is the unique position of the Technion that they have better, I think, than any other technical institute in the world married uh, medical disciplines, if you will, to engineering and other aspects of uh, scientific research. So instead of having uh, an engineer take a, a class in some medical subject and have a, an MD student take an engineering class, you have engineers getting medical degrees and you have doctors getting mechanical engineering degrees. It is a much deeper melding of knowledge and as these two gentlemen will tell you, almost any scientific endeavor these days is multidisciplinary. You need collaboration. You need access to other disciplines at your fingertips. And that is something that the Technion has uh, developed to the nth degree. So I, I don't know if I answered your original question, but I, everything leads to something else and is connected to something else in the scientific realm. And I, I would say that through that, connectivity, the Technion is involved in virtually every aspect of science. I would agree. It covers all the, the, the major branches of science and engineering, <clears throat> uh, biology, chemistry, physics, and then, of course, all the different engineering disciplines, material science, mathematics, of course, and, and a medical school. I, I just w w only wanted to add also that one of the big focus areas for the Technion today is on energy and sustainability because Tikkun Olam has very much scientific dimensions. So if we, we can build a world that can sustain the level of innovation uh, that we have today with doing the least amount of harm to the environment, uh, that's, that's a tailored made uh, project for the Technion. And I'll just add to that, that when you look at what Israel has achieved over the last four or five years, not only in terms of technological achievements, but what we call the diplomatic dividend. Relationships with 12 countries in Africa that wanted nothing to do with us, um, boycotted us. And now the president of Zambia and talks about his love for, for the Jewish people and for Zionism. And of course, relationships in, in Asia of a, of a similar vein. The, the foundations of this have been ag tech, solar, water, communications, and medicine. 
each of these areas has its roots at the technion, which I believe firmly means that the technion's value to the country as a scientific institution has also been to enable Israel to strengthen its worldwide connections. Thank you very much for that. That's beautiful. Um, Reb Aaron, I saw that you had a question. Please go ahead and ask it directly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you for a great presentation. And thank you to Reb Zalman, you know, for everything you do, getting everybody together. Um, uh, I was just curious. Uh, it's, a, it's a great program. And I was just uh, curious. Obviously, the Haredi community needs time for their for their, you know, their prayer and for their, their Torah and Talmud studies and so on. Uh, and that work, I, so part of question number one is, does that work out okay? Time allowances are made and that's uh, not, not an issue, which sounds like it's not, but I just wanted to ask that. And the, the other thing is, uh, there's obviously the social aspect about integration into a community like this. Is there something to be learned about integrating the, from this, about integrating the Haredi uh, community into the military? Great question. Uh, I don't know how to answer the military aspect of that question. Uh, as to the first part of your question, every Technion student, whether Haredi or not, finds that the demands of their time are almost unbearable and they, they okay. over time, learn to prioritize uh, and do what is their highest priority. And for this community, uh, maintaining their religious studies is, is certainly one of their highest priorities. And to the extent that they possibly can do it, they have the opportunity to do it. But it is a challenge for them, I'm sure. But it is a challenge for every Technion student to meet the demands on their time. Uh, but but it, it, it works out OK. They're able to uh, maintain their Haredi perspective with their needs. Oh, yeah, uh, I think together absolutely. With the, yeah. If you had the opportunity to talk to Yehuda Sabiner, who the MD student, I think he would emphatically say yes. He is as much Haredi today as he was on the day he started yeah. down this path. That he has not sacrificed that impulse or those feelings, uh, and he just. Uh, I think that's what he would say. Okay, that's great. I'll open and, that to it. So I, as I mentioned, I was on campus. Um, it used to be time I traveled two weeks a month, uh, not so much right now. Uh, and while being on the campus in January, walking around it, it was one of the most unique experiences because it showed what Israel is and what Israel can become. So walking along under the student, uh, the student uh, society building and very nice cafeteria and, and stuff there. And what do I see? I see a group of Haredi gentlemen who are praying at, uh, for a, a certain time of the day. Walking into the building, I see a group of, this was, I, I, w I was going to take a picture, but I would, they would, probably would have thought that I was weird or stalking them or who knows, it was, it would have been highly inappropriate. But I'm seeing a group of people sitting together studying. Two clearly Arab women with, with the, the headscarves, an Ethiopian, a person from Asia, um, because there were about several hundred and close to a thousand international students and some Israelis. And they're giggling and laughing and studying and complaining, obviously, about how hard their work is. And I'm saying, oh my God, that's what Israel's become. It has become a place that really is on Israel. It has become a light onto the nations. It's become a place for all people. And to see that happen uh, on a, in a country that is not even a hundred years old and that has struggled so much and relies on, on not only Technion, but all of its universities for its, its survival and for its, its future, to have that kind of diversity was inspiring. So yes, it is fully, the Technion embraces our Haredim students that they can ha maintain their religious observance and it's true for every student on campus. So should it also be possible to integrate the, the Haredim into the military in a very efficient way? If you can do it in the in a challenging environment like this, that may be a very difficult question. I just yeah. not ours to answer, but I think the IDF is is the great dem democratizer or equalizer in, in in Israel for the most part, and and I'm hopeful that that will be true also for those who who have religious observance as part of their critical part of their lives. Well, you can, you can think about it in this respect and. Uh, the IDF needs physicians as much as any other organization, and, and so that might be a role that Haredi 
uh, could fill and, and there would be other uh, jobs like that, I guess, that would be suitable. But uh, your earlier comment, David, about the diversity reminded me of a, a personal experience I had. I've, over the years, become friendly with uh, the Dean of Engineering at a, a local technical university here in Detroit called Lawrence Tech. Uh, he's Egyptian by birth, but he immigrated to the United States when I think he was 11 years old because the, uh, the discrimination and pressure and uh, abuse of Christians at that time was as bad as it is now, or worse, I guess. And uh, he has, over the years, collaborated with a researcher on the Technion campus, Arnon Bentour. David, you would know him. Yes, uh, and he visited the campus to work with Dr. Bentour and was sharing with me the fact that he has never felt safer practicing his religion, Coptic Christianity, than when he was in Israel, when he was at the Technion, and when he had visited the uh, Christian sites in Israel, the, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane was particularly moving apparently for him. But just to underscore what you said about uh, Israel, but also the Technion as the epitome, as the ideal for this um, celebration of humanity and what human potential can do. Thank you. Thank you for the great question and thank you for those uh, inspiring answers. I would like to, um, I, I, I guess, just pile on and add another perspective that I think, um, at least from my perspective, one of the things that prepared me for life generally in a way that I'm grateful for is my years in yeshiva where you start early in the morning and you end late at night and it's very intensive studying, uh, far more intensive starting from the age of 13 uh, all the way to the age of 20 in my case. And then I continued with further education to become a rabbi um, for another four years. Um, it was very intensive studies from a very young age. I think there, in many ways, there's an advantage that Haredi studies, students would have. Uh, they would find, obviously, the work to be new and different and not what they're used to. But in terms of the discipline and the amount of time and effort that's needed to be able to make the, and also the critical thinking that comes along with Talmud, um, I think a lot of that is very helpful to prepare someone for the life of uh, intense university life. Um, Saul, Cheryl, any questions for yourselves? You guys are, you guys typically like to talk about things related to universities, particularly <laughs> medicine, no? It's a very decent place. They do good work. <laughs> you seem, uh, you seem to be more proud of Columbia for some reason, I'm thinking. <laughs> I could give you a hundred reasons, but let's not go into that. <laughs> well, Rabbi, if I may just add on to the comments you were making, I've had uh, Peretz Levy in particular and others at the Technion have made a comment, uh, and yours, your comments reminded me of this, that the Haredi community, because of the disciplines that you just described, include many individuals who have the mental discipline and the brilliance to be successful. It, it just needs to be coached a little bit in, in a uh, certain way so that they can adapt those skills to the information that is presented at the tech. Now, they have the abilities to be successful um, and probably in some circumstances more successful than someone coming out of just a, a secular type educational background. So I, you, you made a very good point. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions that we have? <clears throat> Andy, I'd love to see your beautiful face. Andy, are you there? Elon, Elon, your beautiful face, please. We'd love your questions. Carolyn, there you go, Elon. Jump on, let's unmute yourself and show your video. There he is. Hello, hello, thank you, thank you. In a car, so excuse the video. Um, so uh, thank you guys for, for presenting. What do you think uh, the next 10 years looks like for, for Technion and um, what, uh, what do you want to see and, and um, how, can, how can Americans and Israelis do even more collaboration um, than it already is? Well, I'll address the first part of your question in terms of uh, what the future holds. Our current president, Uri Sivan, has a vision that, uh, I'll, I'll just summarize it, in, in uh, cross-disciplinary um, uh, centers where 
in the, in the field of biology, for example, you can have a computer scientist, a mechanical engineer, and uh, all sorts of other disciplines collaborating on uh, biological topics. Uh, and that concept can be extended in all sorts of different directions. In terms of specific uh, disciplines, uh, quantum computing is something that is uh, a high priority going forward. Uh, one of the uh, impediments that the Technion is facing, that the demand for people in that field is so high, the competition for people in that field is so high that uh, it's becoming a, an issue getting an adequate uh, supply, if you will, of individuals in that, in, in that discipline, but the Technion will be successful ultimately, I'm sure. But I would say uh, cross-discipline collaboration is going to be one of the highlights going forward. Yeah, the, it, we are really guided by the, the, the vision, and that word is being used by me very intentionally, of the Technion for its future. Uh, President Uri Savan says the, the goals of Technion are no less than addressing the grand challenges facing humanity in the 21st and 22nd centuries. And quantum engineering, computing is part of that. We talked about the energy and sustainability. Another area that we didn't talk about which will help lift up some of the most disadvantaged populations in Israel, including the Haredim, is the industrial sector. And, and Technion's answer to that is advanced manufacturing. Well, what that basically means is how do you introduce artificial intelligence and other technologies into lower tech and middle tech industries? And the idea is that the industrial base of Israel is in, in the center, center north of the country, near Haifa, where the university is. So Technion's taking a big bet on becoming one of the global leaders of advanced manufacturing. Some people call it the fourth industrial revolution, because not only does it help Israel become more competitive, and increase its economic output, but what it really means is more jobs for people who are either unemployed or underemployed, particularly in, in the northern part of Israel. And so to answer your question, Yohan, it, it really is true that Technion has a national charter and, and, and it thinks about where does Israel need to be in 2050? And what is it that we as a university, as a, as a think tank, uh, as a, a training ground need to do for the country to get us to where we need to be. Thank you very much for that. Um, if uh, David, Scott, if someone joining us tonight would like to stay in touch with you, learn more about the programs that you're offering at the Technion, learn more about the Haredi program, how it's impacting. Um, I mean, if they're interested in data, if they wanna dig deep into this and appreciate the work that you're doing on a, on a deeper level, perhaps support the work that you're doing, how could they get in touch with you? Where could they learn more? What's the best way for our community to be able to reach you going forward? Uh, David, uh, let me go first. It's very simple. In my case, my email is scott, S-C-O-T-T -T dot leemaster, L-E-E-M-A-S-T-E-R -E -E at gmail.com. Great. Awesome. But you took my answer. I just put it into the chat box, my email address. <laughs> uh, David C at ATS.org. Uh, by all means, visit our, our website, www.ats.org. But more importantly, yeah, you can, you can, we can send everyone to a website, including the American Technion Society. We'd love to have a personal connection, one of the great parts of our organization. And this is a solicitation, not of money, but of, of heart, is that we build personal relationships with people who care about our mission. And we would love nothing more than to extend our, our network of friends to include Wyoming and to, God willing, one day visit your beautiful community. So please, Scott and I, uh, await your messages. And, uh, I would also add for, for those of us who, who um, live in other places during the winter, if you do happen to live in a bigger population center, there's a good likelihood that the Technion has a chapter there with amazingly interesting speakers and meetings that you could enjoy. And in these days, uh, the opportunity to join uh, webinars put together by the ATS and sometimes the ATS 
and other societies around the world, uh, Technion UK and the ATS did a joint webinar recently. But these are continually being uh, promoted on the ATS.org website, and they are easy to connect to. Uh, fascinating topics, and just the, the range and depth of the material that you are presented is, is inspiring and uh, very interesting. It really is. We, we did a lot of uh, uh, webinars because Technion has 50 labs focused on COVID, some of which it is now reaching, uh, moving from lab bench to bedside to the marketplace. Uh, we had recently Peretz Levy, our former president, talk about how to have a good night's sleep during the era of COVID. So uh, if nothing else, if you come to one of our seminars or webinars, uh, you'll have a good night's sleep or you'll, you'll, maybe your food engineering people will give us a good recipe using an engineered uh, plant-based meat or something. So lots to keep, uh, keep everyone engaged, just like the webinars that the rabbi is doing here with his wife. Would you uh, briefly just share with us uh, COVID-related research that you guys are doing? Any uh, potential vaccines? Is there a direction that you think we're heading? Is there a timeline that you think uh, we should consider or think about? I know these are big questions each on their own, but if there's any exciting things that are going on in specific that you can point us to, um, that would be great. Well, the most promising drug in the world or vaccine right now is I believe from Moderna, um, in full disclosure, I probably own 10 shares of it, but I don't think that's material <laughs> in terms of its amount. And its chief medical officer is an Israeli, uh, not a Technion graduate, but boy, do we love him. And in terms of innovations coming directly from the Technion, yes, they are working on at least one vaccine, yet it's one of 150 shots at the apple. The, the areas that are particularly promising that are coming from the Technion around COVID there's a uh, professor Josue Snitman, uh, originally from Switzerland and studied in the US and in Europe. And he's found a way of turning an aerosol gel into a delivery system into the lungs. So during the last stage of COVID to which people uh, succumb, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, this foam gel will be injected into the lung and provide life-saving medicine so that the lung can breathe again. And it, it's one of the most promising treatments. There are a lot of technologies as well. Uh, Self-cleaning masks, a mask sticker that will capture uh, the, the virus, um, a, a new kind of sanitizer and disinfectant that is 20 times as, as, as long lasting as what's available right now. Robotic nurses, uh, new ways of, of testing and pooling tests just to give you a sampling of them. And the, the, the examples I'm giving you right now are not just like, oh, gee whiz, these are great ideas. These are concepts that are moving into the marketplace with funding and with uh, the co proper kinds of, of commercial partners. So uh, Technion is going to have its impact among many other universities and, and companies to, to help address the, the COVID crisis. No doubt about that. Let me just add that, that the, the, because of this virus, the Technion uh, was seriously impacted. They were forced uh, for distancing purposes to close their gates for two months. But as typical of the Raisleys, they look for the, look for the opportunity in the challenge. Instead of just dealing with the challenge and stumbling onto opportunities, they consciously, in this process, look for the opportunities so they can uh, improve the lives of others, not just deal with the situation at hand, but looking forward, how do we improve the lives of others in all different ways? As David said, from a mask, from a robot that delivers water or medication or other materials to a patient's bedside without having to gown up and disinfect itself afterward. Uh, it's, the gamut is uh, unlimited. It's just uh, unimaginable, the range of ideas that, are, that emerge. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Scott and David, so much for all of this fascinating information and inspiration. And thank you, Karen, for conducting this evening's interview. Uh, any final comments before we call it a night? I actually do have one last question, which is when I look at the future of the, the marriage of uh, technology, engineering, and medicine, there are so many beautiful, wonderful 
things that are coming out. There are also nightmare scenarios and the moral dimension of all of this is more important than ever as we contemplate turning people into cyborgs and engineering, uh, through genetic engineering, engineering strange concoctions. Um, what is, how is the Technion addressing these moral dimensions of science and medicine? They, they, sir, Scott, do you wish to go first? I don't know the formal process, but I'm sure when such questions emerge, there are ethicists uh, in various fields who um, are available to help the Technion address them. I, I guess that would be my answer. I can go a little deeper because uh, we, we just heard a, a presentation from um, the Vice President of University, uh, Professor Alon Wolf, who, by the way, has created robotic uh, spine surgery assist devices, uh, Mazor Robotics, and even a 3D printable hand for, for children who have lost limbs. So that's, I guess, part of the answer is that a lot of the decisions are driven by the heart. But the more detailed answer is that Technion takes this very seriously. They call it the, the, the rounded student of the 21st century. And that means that there will be courses in ethics, in environment, in sustainability, in multidisciplinary approaches to looking at the same issue, design thinking, informing the whole curriculum. And we have a wonderful supporter, a Holocaust survivor, I'll mention her name from Chicago, a woman named Sonia Marshak, who has single-handedly been one of the most important forces at the Technion in creating a Department of Humanities. And the vision that she and the former president, Peretz Levy, had is in order for a Technion student to be successful in the world, they need to be a three-dimensional individual. And part of that is exposure to music and ideas and literature and critical thinking that doesn't just come from science. So it is, it is part of the fabric of a Technion education to be thinking about these kinds of questions. And yes, it is, it is something that we have to worry about. And I would suggest that the, your Haredi students will be big contributors in this aspect of the Technion's it's true. Um, if you ever culture. get a chance to visit, you'll see the high rates of volunteerism on campus. It is really extraordinary. One example is you'll see a lot of students with seeing eye dogs, and they're not blind. They're training the dogs as therapy animals or for people with low vision because every student, or, or not every student, I can't say that, but many students feel that they are at the Technion for a mission, a purpose not just in education. And, and that's why I'm so proud to be their, their emissary, their servant, uh, public servant on behalf of their work here in the US because it's for them. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you, you uh, thank you, thank you, Scott and David. And thank you, Karen. Have a wonderful night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much for inviting us. It was a pleasure. I hope thank to see you, you in Scott. person. Yes, it was yes. fun. We look forward to it. Please join us Shabbat. The next time you're in Jackson Hole, it would be our honor and pleasure to have you. I promise. Thank you. May you Take have a care. blessed summer. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good, good night, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.